Okay, good. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Thanks to Luce for inviting me. Um, this is, uh, I think, my first public lecture in Hong Kong, so it's, this is a real treat. Um, Self-interest and how it affects the world around us, and what impact it has on effect. That, that's a kind of a weird title, right? I mean, if you grew up like me, I grew up in a good Jewish household. You guys grew up maybe in Chinese households, and some of you are Europeans. You were taught from when you were very, very young that self-interest is what? Bad, right? Greedy. Right? Evil. Evil. Right? So self-interest and in improving the world? I mean, what's that got to do with one another, right? That, that, that doesn't go together. From when we're this young, we're taught what? We're taught that what is, what is virtue? What is goodness? What is moral? To do what? <laughs> to live for others. To serve others. My mother taught me to think of myself last. To think of other people first. Now, we can talk about whether my mother actually meant that, or whether any mother actually means that, right? Particularly Chinese mothers. But that's what they tell us. And they don't tell us that by accident. It's because their mothers told them that. It's because every preacher at every church, or every synagogue, or every uh, uh, religious institution says that that's what you should do. Because every philosopher, almost, with a few exceptions, has said that the standard of goodness, the standard of virtue, the standard of living a good life is to subjugate yourself and to serve others. We erect statues. We call boulevards. We give names to these things to people who we perceive as having made big sacrifices, have served the so-called common good. We have a certain perception of what is right, what is good, what is moral, what is virtuous, and it's all associated with being selfless, or at least a perception of being selfless, of sacrifice, of living for others in one way or another. And when we think about self-interest, what do we think of? When you point at a kid in the schoolyard and you say, he's being self-interested or he's being selfish, what do we mean? Unscrupulous. Yeah, we mean unscrupulous. This kid has all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> unscrupulous, you're absolutely right, right? Because we don't think, well, if you, the actual definition, the actual description of self-interest is taking care of self. We don't think, oh, he takes care of himself. We think he's unscrupulous. That is, he does what he does at other people's expense. He'll lie, steal, cheat, stab us in the back to get his way. We've been taught that. That's what self-interest means to us. So we have, we've been taught, we've been educated, very consciously, that morality, virtue, goodness is about selflessness, about taking care of others, about sacrifice. What does a sacrifice mean? What does sacrifice mean? Because we use it a lot, but, but we almost never never actually. What does it mean to sacrifice? It's me paying a price for someone else. So you're paying a price for someone else, so I don't know, I, I paid 300 bucks for my iPhone. Was that a sacrifice? Without regard to your own benefit. Yeah, so sacrifice is you give something and what do you get in return? Either nothing or negative. Yeah, something negative, something or nothing. Right? Because when I buy an iPhone, what do we call that? We don't call it that. Nobody actually thinks that me buying an iPhone is a sacrifice. Well, at least not for me. Maybe, maybe you guys buy iPhones as sacrificial. <laughs> yeah, well, a, sa a sacrifice would be me buying an Android. That's right. Um, but what do we call it when I buy an iPhone? Do we call it a sacrifice? No, what do we call it? A trade. And what's the, what's the characteristic of a trade? What's the nature of trade? Mutual benefit. I buy this iPhone for three hundred dollars because it's worth how much to me? How much is it worth to me if I buy it for three hundred dollars? No, it can't be three hundred, guys. Econ one hundred and one. You wouldn't bother. You wouldn't bother, right? If it was if it was exactly the same, you wouldn't bother. 
You know, the effort of sticking your hand in your pocket and taking the 300 bucks, not worth it. You will value this more than what you're willing to pay for it. When you buy a nice pair of shoes for X number of Hong Kong dollars, I won't speculate. Um, it's because you value the shoes more than you value the money. You're not sacrificing. You're improving your life by buying those shoes. You're improving your life by buying the iPhone. And on the other side, Apple is improving their fate by selling me the iPhone. They are making money. They're making a profit. I get, uh, uh, the value I get from the iPhone is productivity, coolness, you know, whatever it happens to be, right? Apple gets money for it. But we're both benefiting. It's a trade. The nature of a trade is mutual benefit, win-win. The nature of sacrifice, by the definition of a sacrifice, is that it's somebody loses. You, if you're sacrificing, lose. Otherwise, why is it a sacrifice? Otherwise, it would be a trade. If you're winning and the other party's winning, why not call it a trade? So we're taught the nobility of sacrifice. That's goodness. That's right. And almost nobody ever stops to ask a really, really crucial question. Why? Why should I sacrifice? Why should I live for other people? Why are the lives of other people more important than mine? Where does this come from? This commandment. Why is my life? You get one shot at this, all of you. <laughs> one. <laughs> Unless you're Buddhist and then there are many, but you know, we'll put that aside. Let's, let's just assume there's one. You get one shot at this life. Why not live it? For you. Why is somebody else's one shot at this more important than yours? And if you ask that to your preacher, to your philosopher, to your mother, I don't think you're going to get a very satisfactory answer. Generally, the answer is, because we tell you so. <laughs> because God told you so. Or because the philosopher king has commuted with the world of forms. That's a reference to Plato. And is telling you so. Ayn Rand asks the question, why? Why is it my life what's important? And her answer is that there is no why, there is no answer, because they're wrong. Each one of us, each human life, 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 generally, as living beings, we face an alternative. We can live or we can stop living. We can exist or we can go out of existence. To be or not to be. It's a pretty profound statement that Hamlet makes. To be or not to be. To exist or not to exist. To live or not to live. That's the essential choice that every living being has. A plant, an animal, a human being. Plants and animals know the answer automatically. Not only do they know that they want to live, they know how to do it. They have it ingrained, they have it programmed, it's in there, it's genetically automatic. A plant knows it needs sunlight, you put it in the shade, it goes finds the sunlight. It needs water, so it'll send it roots out to find the water. An animal knows how to hunt, it knows what to do, but we, for the most part, have no knowledge of any of this stuff. We don't know how to live. We don't know. We require knowledge. We require choice. We have free will. We have to choose to live as a first choice, and then we have to figure out how to live. How many of you know how to skin an animal and make clothes? I don't. <laughs> Grow wheat? No. Build a spear? I mean, we could probably figure that out. That sounds, seems easy. But my guess is that if I was actually in the middle of the jungle and had to build a, sphere, a spear, it would not be easy. It would be hard. We don't, we're not programmed. We don't have it. We don't have that intrinsic knowledge. Biology has not pre-programmed us to know this stuff. We have to figure it out. And what Ayn Rand teaches us 
is that morality, the science of ethics, should not be about dying, should not be about serving others, should not be about making other people's life better. It should be about figuring out, figuring out scientifically what it takes to live, to live as a human being, to live the best life that you can live, to make the most of the one shot you have on this earth, to be, to use a cliche, the best that you can be as a human being. And it's not easy. It's not trivial to figure this out. And you need to engage with the world in order to find answers. It's hard. And if there is a science of ethics, the science of ethics should be about helping us to do that by providing us with principles, with ideas of how to do this, of what is required. And if we just think broadly, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do a whole seminar here on ethics, but what is the one thing that makes it possible for us as human beings to live, to survive, to thrive, to be successful in living as human beings? What, what, is, it, what is it that makes it possible for us to figure out how to turn animal hides into clothes, how to build a spear, how to grow food. Reason. Yeah, human reason, our ability to use our minds, our thinking, our rational faculty. So if you're gonna take care of your life, if you're gonna live the best life that you can live, if you're gonna make the most of the one life you have, it's not about the lying, stealing, and cheating that we associate with it. It's about using your reason. It's about being rational. It's about figuring it out. It's about thinking. If you had to boil Ayn Rand's ethics down to one word, it is thinking. The virtue of thinking. That's what the virtue of self-interest is. Self-interest equals thinking. Using your mind. Figure it out. Everything else is a consequence of that one thing. So, Rand would tell us, respect the thinkers, respect the builders, respect the creators, the makers, the people who do with their life, make something of their life, create something with their life, produce, use their reason, apply it to the problems of survival, and build something from that, make something from that. And yet we live in a culture, unfortunately, where that is not appreciated. We don't build statues, name roads, name boulevards for thinkers, for producers, for creators, because they tend to be happy and successful. Right? When was the last time you saw a saint in a, in a painting with a smile on his face? Right? Saints don't smile. They usually have arrows sticking out of them, all kinds of places. Because the whole idea of morality in our usual, commonplace, conventional framework is moral equals suffering, moral equals sacrifice. Ayn Rand gives us a morality for living, a morality for happiness, a morality for smiling, for having a good life, right? for being happy, for being successful. A morality for loving, loving life, loving the things that make life possible, that make life successful. So if we look at some examples, right? if we look at successful people out there and how the culture looks at them, take somebody like, I like to use Bill Gates as an example, right? Bill Gates, everybody know Bill Gates? Former CEO, founder of Microsoft, richest man in the world, last I saw. Although after, after the stock declines, I, I'm not sure, but Bill Gates built a company from nothing. Built what at the time was, in the early 90s, the biggest company in the world. Made for himself $70 billion. How do you make $70 billion? Well, if I knew I'd go and make it, but um, yeah. how, do you, how do you make money? In, in principle, how, how is money made? Making something. Something, something that's worth something to someone else. Making something that's worth something to somebody else, right? What's it? You make money by sacrifice? <laughs> you sacrifice others to make money. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. 
Because why would others sacrifice to you? Depends on their ideas. I, I, so people who come to work at Microsoft sacrificed? Why? They got a check. They had a choice to go work for other companies. They could have stayed where they were originally. What is it about going to work which is a sacrifice? You've got five options. How would you choose between the options? The one that would make you what? Well, the one that would be most fulfilling to you. The one who pays the best, if that's what your main concern is, as some people, right? So why is taking the option that pays you the best a sacrifice? It's, it's the best, right? It's your best option. And therefore, it's an improvement on where you were before. It's a step forward, not a step backward. It's a net gain, not a net loss. It's a trade. It's not a sacrifice. Now, I know, you know, so, so we might as well go there if this is being brought up. I know that there's this perception like, oh, you know, every time an iPhone is made, some employee in Foxconn is only making, I don't know what the going rate at Foxconn is, $3 a day, $5 a day, whatever it happens to be. And that seems like that's awful. Right? Here I am, middle class American, with one of these nice phones, and some Chinese person in Shenzhen is, or Shanghai, wherever Apple makes this, is only getting three bucks a day. But why is the Chinese employee taking that job? Because he's better off. Because he's better off, because the alternatives are worse. Because he's better off. Otherwise, he wouldn't take it. He could go back to the farm. Doesn't want to go back to the farm. Farm's no good. Right? There are other companies that might employ him, but they play less or equal. And what is the benefit he gets by taking that job? Money, but skills. He learns something. And if you track these employees, as some people have indeed gone in and actually tracked them, you find that they slowly advance, they make more money, some of them leave and become entrepreneurs, some of them become managers. They rise up to become the growing middle class of China. You don't start a middle class, you have to start somewhere. And then you rise up. So, it's not a sacrifice. It's a choice, it's a trade. It's not a trade we might do, because we're rich. It's easy for us. We're relative to, to mainland Chinese in many parts of China. We, I can generalize I think on this group, we are relatively rich. So yeah, we wouldn't take that job. But if we deny that person that job, if we say, okay, everybody who touches an apple has to make 10 bucks a day, 100 bucks a day, you decide on the rate, it doesn't matter. What would happen? They'd lose their jobs. Their jobs wouldn't exist. Some of us would say the price of an iPhone would go up to, let's say, $500 or $1,000. And some people, maybe not me, but some people would say, at $1,000, I'm not going to buy this. Sales of Apple would decline, and all those people would lose their jobs. So have you done them a favor by giving them a raise? No. You've hurt them. What causes people to make more money in a, in a, in a market economy? What causes you to go from 3 bucks an hour to 5 bucks an hour to 7 bucks an hour to 1000 bucks an hour? What causes that? Productivity your own productivity. You are now producing more and more and more. And how do you get, how do you get to become more productive? By learning a skill, by having experience, by gaining knowledge. And you can't gain that knowledge, you can't gain that skill, you can't gain that experience unless you have a first job that might pay you nothing. Or very little, not nothing, but very little, right? Nothing is compared to what we would expect to get. Well, internships are a good example where some people get nothing. Of course, internships where people get nothing are typically reserved for middle class kids. Everybody else has to get a minimum wage, right? Which is quite, quite a hypocrisy. So let's go back to Bill Gates. <laughs> Bill Gates made $70 billion by trading with a lot of people. By trading with his employees, to help him make the products that he then sold to all of us and we all bought them. Why did we buy them? 
that we sacrificed when we bought the, the, the products that Microsoft made. Well, yeah, I'm an Apple user, so for me it might have been a sacrifice. But <laughs> even I was an Apple user in the early 90s, in the late 80s, when it was tough to be an Apple user. You guys don't, don't know those days. But um, when you bought a Microsoft product for $100, at the end of the day, how much is that worth to you? Tens of thousands. It's, it's hard to put a number on how much the standardization that Microsoft brought to the computer industry is actually worth. Worth a huge amount. It's changed everybody's life. Even people like me who only use Apple. Microsoft changed our lives. And it changed the lives of almost every human being on the planet. Because Microsoft products are used to make almost everything more efficient. They're used to improve agriculture in Africa. They're used to improve productivity in Asia. They've standardized computing and probably made the internet as we know it today possible. Billions and billions of people around the world are better off for what Microsoft did. And Bill Gates, you know, he made $70 billion off of that. Why? Because billions of people were better off. If you take a billion people and they contribute, you know, they pay for your product just a little bit, it's a lot of money. So what do we think of Bill Gates? What does the culture think of Bill Gates? Good guy? Only altruism. Yeah, not a very good guy when he was at Microsoft. Was he a good guy? Not particularly. Not particularly. Not, a, not, not, not you know, one of those really evil guys, but not a good guy. Right? Even though he changed the life of almost everybody on the planet. Because it's interesting. Our moral code doesn't say you're a good guy if you help other people. Interesting. It doesn't say that, because by that standard, Bill Gates would be a saint. He helped 7 billion people. The moral code actually says that in helping other people, you have to sacrifice. Otherwise, it doesn't count. And Bill Gates didn't sacrifice. He made $70 billion. So we look at him and say, yeah, he helped $7 billion, but he, he's selfish, because he made $70 billion. Helping other people and benefiting doesn't count. You know, there's, there's a lot of micro-lending that happens in places like India and, and Africa and, and other parts of Asia. Micro-lending is when you give small loans to very poor people to start little businesses and, 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 uh, and they grow. And it's, it's, there's some mixed research about it, but generally it's perceived to be a very good thing. It encourages entrepreneurship, it encourages uh, self-responsibility. Well, there are two large micro-lending kind of uh, entities. One is a for-profit and one is a non-for-profit. Profit. Who do you think gets all the credit? The NGOs. The for-profit ones, yeah, we don't like them. Yeah, they're helping as many people, but we don't like them because they're benefiting at the same time. Bill Gates did more to help poor people than any NGO ever has in the history of mankind. Not a good guy because he benefited from it. I mean, that's weird. So when does Bill Gates become kind of a good guy? A little bit. Well, we haven't got the poor yet. He's still rich. He well, he gave up his job at Microsoft. God forbid he should continue to produce and make stuff and actually make any money. And he became a philanthropist. Full time. That's his job. Give money away. Now he's a good guy. Why? Because he's not benefiting. At least not in money. So he's giving money away, left and right. I don't have anything against giving money away. But the fact is that Bill Gates will benefit far fewer people by giving the money away than he did at Microsoft. But this now is considered a moral activity, a good activity, a noble activity. Why? Because he's not benefiting. Even though he'll help fewer people, he's not benefiting. So that's, that's a good thing. Now how do we make Bill Gates a saint? This is where we get to your point, right? If he was poor. Now, if we wanted to make Bill Gates a saint, I have not spoken to the Pope about this. I, I can't verify this, but he would have to give all his money away, move into a tent, and if he could bleed a little bit, we, we want to see blood, we want to see suffering, we want to see pain. Again, you've never seen a painting of a saint with a smile on their face. Then you'd go to church. Then you'd go to church and worship Bill Gates. 
Now that's something there is very, very wrong. How can it be? The building, creating, making, employing people, creating incredible values for people, making good life for yourself. Bill Gates has lived a good life. He's exercised his mind, he's used his reason, he's used his rationality to make his life a good life. Built a nice house for his family, raised kids. He said what, at least from the outside, seems like a very successful life. How can that be eh morally? But when he gives his money away, somehow it gets elevated. How can that be right? How can it be good that we take a genius like Bill Gates, one of the great innovators of the last century, and tell him, stop that. To be a good human being, you have to stop doing what makes you so brilliant. And you have to do something else. Now, you might be good at it, you might not be good at it, but you have to take away his dream, take away his passion, and put it somewhere else just to make him a good person. And if you see Bill Gates talking, I, I've seen him in some interviews he's done. When Bill Gates talks about his philanthropy, you know, he's okay, he seems fairly cheery and, and okay. But when he talks about his investments in technology, when he talks about the technology world, he lights up. He loves this stuff. And yet we're denying him that stuff. Because we're saying, eh, you might make money, God forbid. Something's wrong with the world. If that's the trade-off we accept as good. If that's what we expect of our leaders. When we condemn creativity and productivity and, and building stuff. We'll get to questions, I promise. <laughs> you might even win the best question. Uh, <clears throat> something's wrong. When we admire philanthropy above production. Now, I, I don't, I, I have nothing against philanthropy. I have nothing against charity. If you're supporting values that you really believe in, if you're promoting ideas that you really uphold, or you're helping people you really care for, that's all good. It's all good. But let's not fool ourselves. Philanthropy and charity don't change the world. Philanthropy and charity didn't build Hong Kong. Philanthropy and charity didn't make the U.S. what it is. You know, I like to say the U.S. in 1776, when it was founded, was a third-rate colony. The, 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 the Brits, or the English, didn't really fight. Because it wasn't that important. They were too busy with the French and the Spaniards, and, and the Americans won the war by default almost. Because it was third you know, it's a developing country. By 1913, 150 years later, the United States had the biggest, strongest, most powerful economy in the world by far. That did not happen because of charity, community service, and philanthropy. What did, what, 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 what made that happen? Resources. Help. Resources? Hong Kong. What natural resources does Hong Kong have? The last four. A large port. There are lo lots of large ports in the world. There are lots of bays with ports in the world. You have nothing in Hong Kong. It's a rock in the middle of nowhere. You, yes, you have a port. Lots of places have ports. I, I grew up in a city called Haifa that has a natural port. Believe me, Hong Kong is more impressive than Haifa. <laughs> natural resources? The Soviet Union has more, had more natural resources than America many times over. The Ukra Ukraine, the country of Ukraine, has the most fertile uh, land in the world for agriculture, and yet people were, and to some extent still are, starving in Ukraine. Natural resources? Natural resources don't produce wealth. Natural resources do not produce wealth. Lots of places. Brazil, right? Where's Winston? Winston's from Brazil. Brazil has immense natural resources. And yet they're poor, dirt poor. What produces wealth is businessmen. What produces wealth is capitalism. What produces wealth is businessmen left free. Entrepreneurs left free. That's what produces wealth. And they can take a desert and turn it into wealth. Like Hong Kong. Like Australia. Australia's pretty deserty. Half of Israel is a desert. And the reason it can produce wealth is because of entrepreneurs. And because they're relatively free. Not as free as I'd like, not as free as you are in Hong Kong, but relatively free. That's what produces wealth. 
entrepreneurs like Bill Gates, like Steve Jobs, and all kinds of variations that are not as brilliant and genius, but free people creating businesses, making products, engaging with other people on the basis of win-win transactions, engaging their minds to solve problems, problems that exist in the world, problems that, that by solving them they improve the lives of other people. And none of them do it because they want to necessarily improve other people. They do it because they're trying to make a living for themselves. I mean, Adam Smith recognized this 200 and something years ago in The Wealth of Nations. He, he, he says the baker doesn't bake the bread for you. He doesn't care about you. He bakes the bread for who? For himself. He's trying, to, he's trying to take care of his family. He's trying to make a living. Now, Adam Smith thought that was kind of shady. He didn't particularly like the fact that the baker was doing it for himself. Ayn Rand says, why not? <laughs> it's good that the baker makes his bread for himself. And by doing that, he makes your life better because you get bread at a price that you will need to pay. And it's a trade, it's a win-win. So what makes it possible for us to thrive, what makes it possible for a place like Hong Kong to be so successful, a place like the United States to grow as much as it did, is people pursuing their own self-interest by producing and creating and building. And the political, the political atmosphere that makes that possible is an atmosphere, a system of freedom. Because you can try to pursue your own self-interest in a system that's authoritarian, but you keep bouncing against the gun of the enforcer, the regulator, the controller, the bureaucrat. So what people who want to pursue their own self-interest by, ultimately, by improving the state of the world need is freedom, is to be left alone. If human reason is the way in which we survive, if human reason, our rational mind, is the way in which we thrive as human beings, which we grow and succeed, then what is the enemy of reason? What is the enemy of, of, of rationality? What is the enemy of human thought? What is it that makes it impossible for me to think or to act on that thought? Oh, religion is a barrier. I agree with that. But religion is a barrier I can overcome. Right? I can overcome. I can, I, can, I can reason myself out of religion. But what is something you cannot reason yourself out of? Force. You cannot reason yourself out of somebody else pointing a gun at you. Force is the fundamental enemy a reason, and therefore force is the fundamental enemy of production. Force is the fundamental enemy of self-interest. Force is the fundamental enemy of life, of human life. And we've taken an institution, we've got an institution, this institution has existed for 10,000 years, a human institution called government. And we've given it a monopoly over the use of force. And we've given it the ability to use force against us, to limit our lives, limit our ability to be happy, limit our ability to prosper, to create, to build, to use our reason. You want to start a business? Here's 55 different forms you have to start up, and some bureaucrat's going to decide if it's okay or not. Now, in Hong Kong, it's easy, relatively, to start a business, but it's getting a little harder. I think New Zealand is overtaking you. It's not easier to start a business in New Zealand. Um, you want to you want to you want to make a new drug that might save the lives of millions of people? Well, you have to convince this bureaucrat over there that it's good. He's the standard, not you in the marketplace. Yeah, the FDA or whatever the equivalent of the FDA is, wherever it is. The standard is not truth. The standard is somebody with a gun standing over you. We restrain ourselves. We constrain the entrepreneur's ability to produce, to create, to build. We restrain the ability of individuals to pursue their self-interest. And by pursuing their self-interest, indeed make the world a better place. Because the world is a better place when we pursue our self-interest. Because what's in our self-interest is to think, to create, to produce. Is it in your self-interest to 
lie, steal, and cheat. Many people think it is. But is it? Let's take lying. Anybody lie here? Anybody ever lie? Don't, don't, don't. I don't want to know. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Not if you're trying to pursue a good life. Lying usually means what? You're faking it to somebody else. Now, there are lots of reasons why lying doesn't work, but I, I can give you some personal reasons. You know, I, I'm at the age where I can't remember what actually happened about a week ago, right? I've, I've got a span of limited number of days that I remember stuff. But if I lied last week, if I lied about something that happened last week, I now have to remember two things what really happened and the lie, which is hard, two things. But actually, it's much more than two things. Because after I remember the lie and the truth, who I told the lie to and who I told the truth to, why I told them the lie and why I told them the truth. That's at least six. And it multiplies from there if you really extrapolate. It's too hard. What a waste of brain energy. The truth is one. If you always do it, it's always simple. Right? It might not be always emotionally comfortable, but it's efficient, it's good for the mind, it's good for the brain, it's simple, it's straightforward. Lying is just a waste of resources, waste of time, waste of memory. We have limited, believe me, it's limited. But lying almost always gets really complicated beyond this, right? No, I, 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 I once told this story uh, to a group um, about a guy who, and I made this up, so this was a completely made up story, you know, about a guy who lies to his wife about he's coming home late every night, and he's actually going with his buddies out drinking or partying or whatever, but he comes home and he tells his wife every time that he's, uh, that he's working late, right? That the boss has demanded that he work late, and he, and he, he does it over and over again. And um, he's got a real problem now, right? because he has to make sure that when the wife meets the friends, they all lie for him. And everybody has to get their story right. And the story about which nights and, and exactly what's going on and who the boss is and so on. And it's just complicated. And again, waste of resources, waste of time, and you're gonna get caught. So somebody in the audience raised his hand and said, I know it, this exact thing happened. And the wife called his boss and said, why are you having my husband work late every night? And of course the boss said, I don't. <laughs> Not good. Not good. You, you guys are too young to know that lying to your wife is not a good thing. And getting caught is really, really bad. But you'll have to believe me on this one. I mean, just think about it for a minute. You've got a best friend. Think about what would happen to that relationship if you just one day started, I'm going to lie to him on a regular basis, just for fun. It, it's going to ruin the friendship. If you're in business, anybody in business knows that if you lie to a supplier or you lie to a customer, you can get away with it maybe once, maybe twice. It ain't going to last. Nobody's going to do business with you. If you're an employee and you start lying to your boss, you're going to lose your job. You're not going to stay there for very long. Lying is, the, is a dumb policy. It's not good for you. It's bad for you. And it's bad for this wonderful instrument we have up here. Our reason, our rationality. This is the instrument we need to really take care of. Because this is what allows us to survive. This is what allows us to thrive. This is what allows us to do well in life. And lying pollutes it, corrupts it. There's a term in computers. Somebody here is probably in computers, maybe many of you. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage into here, garbage out. You can't afford to put garbage into you. Lying is garbage. Faking reality is garbage. Putting your wishes, your whims, your emotions above your reason, above evidence, is garbage. This is the instrument you have to fine tune. You have to keep in great shape. Because it's what your survival, your happiness, your success is going to depend on. This is why education is so important. One good thing our mothers teach us is to be educated because it's good for you. And by the way, this is the thing about the sacrificial morality that is so common in a culture. 
nobody actually believes in it. My mother didn't think, didn't mean for me to think of myself last. She wanted me to be successful. And you can't be successful if you think of yourself last. Right? Just like your mothers wanted you to be successful. She urged me to get an education. For whom? So I could sacrifice to other people? No, she wanted me to get an education so I could live a better life. See, but that, somehow we've compartmentalized. That's, that's different. That's practical life. Morality is over here. We all admire Mother Teresa. But how many of us really, honestly, want to be Mother Teresa? So what happens to many people? And again, not so much when you're young, when you get older. You're living a life that's mostly based on self-interest. You've gone and got a good job. You've made some money. You've had a family. You've lived for yourself to some extent or another most of your life. And at the back of your mind is this, your mother is saying, have you sacrificed enough? Have you given enough? Mother Teresa is urging you over here to, to sacrifice and to be selfless. And inside you've got, on the one hand, you've lived a pretty self-interested life. And on the other hand, your ideal is Mother Teresa. What is the emotion that causes when you win, live one thing and believe in something else? Guilt. 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 Comes from an older guy. Not very old, but old. Because when you're, we're young, we don't feel it. It's something that accumulates over time. Guilt. To me, one of the great tragedies out there is that successful people feel guilty, not for their vices, but for their virtues, for their success, for their prosperity. They feel guilty for that. So what Ayn Rand urges us to do is scrap that morality. It's impractical, it's immoral, it doesn't make any sense, it's not good for anybody, nobody actually wants it, it doesn't have any it doesn't have any basis in reality, it doesn't have any reasons for it. Scrap it. There's a much better alternative. A return to morality as it should be. A morality that teaches us how to live. This is really Aristotle's vision for morality. How to achieve, in Greek, eudaimonia, happiness, flourishing, success. Be rational. And if you read The Virtue of Selfishness, which I think is here, um, she articulates some of the principles that would guide you. You've got to discover those principles for yourself and figure out how to live a good life. And a good life leads to self-esteem. How do you get self-esteem? Self-esteem is the sense, a positive sense about yourself. How do you get that? How do you get that? In America today, we believe you get that by giving everybody a ribbon. But that's not how you get self-esteem. You don't get self-esteem from other people patting you on the back. How do you get self-esteem? from achieving things, from setting, goal, setting goals, achieving them, and recognizing that you've achieved them. Having pride in yourself. I did it. I achieved it. Cool. And when you do that, you get self-esteem. Self-esteem is a prerequisite for happiness. It's a prerequisite for living a guiltless, unearned guilt I'm talking about, guilt that you don't deserve life. That's what we should be thinking about, should be studying. And if you get that, if you get the idea that my life is mine, to live as I see fit, as long as I don't hurt other people, I should be left alone because I want to choose my values. I want to decide what to do with my life. I want to decide how to live my life. Then what kind of political system do we want? As individuals, self-esteem. As individuals who want to pursue their own happiness, who want to choose their own values, who want to choose how to live their own life. What kind of political system do we want? Do we want mother government sitting on our shoulder telling, don't drink that soda, too much sugar, don't eat that meat, don't start that business. We want to be left alone. We don't want other people choosing our values for us, nudging us to do this or to do that. We want to be able to use our own minds, to use our own reason, to choose our own values, and to act on those values. And that political system is a political system of freedom. We want to be left alone. We want to be free. Laissez-faire laissez capitalism. Laissez-faire means, what does it mean? Left alone. Left alone. Leave us alone. Leave, uh, you know, leave us alone capitalism. Laissez-faire capitalism. Leave us alone capitalism. Hands off. 
So capitalism, in my view, freedom, in my view, rests on a foundation of individualism, of individuals pursuing their own self-interest rationally and wanting to do that and pursuing that and they want to be left free. That's the only moral basis, moral foundation for a truly free society. You have as close as we have today in the world a free society here in Hong Kong. I hope you study, you, you, you engage with some of these ideas to build a solid foundation so that you make Hong Kong even freer than it is today. Thank you all.